Yeah, and I will share my screen right now. We're live now, guys. So let me just share this for a little bit. Am I in the broadcast studio? Are you hearing me? We're live. Alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. We are actually very live and I want to start off by saying happy International Women's Day to every single person that will be viewing whether now or later, whether you're live or you are on the replay. I just want to say to you, happy International Women's Day. Choose to challenge and we could not have had a more appropriate theme and with that theme in mind, we couldn't have had more fitting persons, more fitting women, more powerful women coming to have a conversation with me on resilience. So women, my amazing queens, good evening to you. How are you doing? Hi, Henneke. Good evening. Fantastic. And thank you so much for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. You are an amazing woman. I say I salute you. I love you. I honor you. Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, that's Tanya Powell. And to Tracy and Harridge, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Hanika. How are you? I am great. And good evening, Dr. Ensemble Jaja. What a go on. <laughs> uh I am wonderful, I'm blessed, I'm highly favored, and I'm highly flavored. And my sisters, happy International Women's Day. We celebrate ourselves today, and we celebrate the blessings that God continues to just pour into our lives. Absolutely, Amen. absolutely. And, you know, so many times I find myself, I'm doing all sorts of events, you know, business, entrepreneurial stuff, speaking here, doing this and we're, you know, all the events I'm organizing are for businesses, you know, or mon some money-making ventures. But, you know, when I thought to myself, it's International Women's Day, you know, coming up, 
let me just have an impromptu um, calling of the minds, meeting of the minds, having some women share from very different backgrounds, you know, with different stories and just different, just different overall. But yet you are, I'm sure we can find as we listen along the way, common threads that are mm-hmm. holding you together, you know, common threads that, we, you know, that you all displayed. So it's going to be a rather informal conversation. But here's what I want, how I want to start. I want to start off by having you all introduce yourself. So I'm going to ask, um, let me start with Tracian. Go ahead, Tracian. And what would you want us to know about you? Who is Tracian? All right. So Tracian, ever since I've introduced myself, I tend to say tenacious Tracy. So I'm a lady that's filled with tenacity. I am also a God-fearing person. I believe that there is an almighty that sits high and he looks low. I am also a family person. I'm family oriented. I love my family dearly. I hold them dearly to my heart. I love my children. I'm also a community person. I love my community. I love working with youths. I am an advocate for victims of domestic violence and child abuse. And I am a founder of the newly I seed and that's I S E E E D. So that's I for self, S social, E environmental, E entrepreneurial, E educational, D development. And that caters to the holistic development of youth. So that's a little bit about myself. Well, that's a lot, actually. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. I love Tenacious, and Tenacious Tracy. I love that. Really, really thank love you. that. Tanya, let's hear it from you. Oh, thank you, Hennicott. Tracy, how am I supposed to follow that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I want, I think you know, I want to borrow that. Um, so Tanya Powell is my name. And it is, for me, who I am is just, you know, someone who is becoming, but in my process of becoming, I am empowering and I am inspiring. And as I think about that journey and and my journey, you know, it's it's a Dr. Maya Angelou's quote that has begun to help me to define and it, you know, that you may encounter many defeats, but you must not be defeated. And so I know we're going to talk about our story, but for me, you know, having what I consider myself to be a cancer thriver, not a survivor, um, you know, and bringing that to the world and saying to, to, to women primarily, but not only women, it's about living now. It's about thriving despite adversity, but we gotta now go within and find who we are, rediscover our dreams and our passions and go for them with everything that we've got. So that's just a little bit about who I am now. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. And I love Cancer Thriver. No surviving our own here. We've passed Mm -hmm. survival stage and we're looking to thrive. It's all about thriving, yeah? Awesome. All right. Yeah, and now to the one and only Dr. Ensemble Jajad. Ensemble, talk to me. Who are you? (laughs) <laughs> you know, when you ask that question and I listened to Tracy and I said, wow, Tracy Ann has really defined herself so amazingly. And uh, then I listened to Tanya and I said, blows out skirt, the woman, a powerful boy. <laughs> and I am so grateful to be among you, to be in your presence, because just the little you have said so far has inspired me so much. I am and Sombi Jaja. That's my name, and it means God's gift of abounding joy, and that's what I strive to become. I am the mother of four wonderful children and five amazing grandchildren, and I am just so grateful to God that one, he has chosen me to be his child, because that's one of the things I am. I am a child of God, an instrument of God, being used by God to deliver his messages to anybody who needs it right across the world. 
We've lost you a little right bit. Right across the world. Yes. And back, my back. desire is to become a global speaker. And that's one of the reasons why I became a John Maxwell team member to hook my wagon to the huge John Maxwell global chain, train, 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 so that I can inspire many, many, many persons to transform their lives and become the best of themselves that they can be. Awesome sauce. And since you're already in the hot seat um, in some way, I'm going to ask you to share a little bit about, because you put a nice summary to it, and, you know, global speaker, you want to be global speaker. Uh, you know, you're doing these amazing things and you have five, four children and five lovely grandchildren and you are a woman. I look to you, you are my strength. When, you know, when, when Lisa Nichols said to me that boy, you know, when my, on my down days bore her strength, I immediately thought about you and how many times I've had to borrow your strength along my journey and you have poured into so many people myself included you're an inspiration but i am going to say i'm going to go on a limb and say i know it didn't start that way for you so what has been your journey like over the years um perhaps take us a young girl perhaps a young girl is listening right now take us a little through the young ensemble what were you like um, yeah, give us a little taste of that. The young and some this girl born to a wonderful family in the village of Ashley in Moco Clarendon. I was the third class. It was me, then it was my uh, brother who passed, and my last sister, who is my who happens to be my best friend in life. She's amazing. And um, I grew up in a really nurturing family, a family that really, especially my father, my father had a big visions. At the time we were poor, but we never knew so we were poor because every day we were eating good food from the farm and didn't realize that um, that was considered poor people food because we're eating yam and breadfruit and banana and those kinds of stuff. I went to Uncle Granny basic school um, until you, I was about six. One Uncle second, Granny I think your volume, your Uncle audio Granny. is a little bit out of work again. I don't know if anything has shifted for you or your, your mobile device or something because we're, I can hardly hear you now. Are you kidding me? Yes, I'm hearing you great now. Great, yes. Stay right okay, there. So I might have shifted something. Yes. You're hearing me better. Right, now. yes. You were talking about, you know, you you were I'm, having the, that, the food from the farm was, and all of that. I was one of those, those love like a children, just love, you know. I was in everything at school. I was in the choir, couldn't sing, but I was in the choir. Um, I was in festival every time we, anything on stage, yeah, at that, in those early years. I was a tomboy. I used to play cricket with the boys. I used to play marbles. But that time we called it cashew because we used to have the cashew um, in the ring and we used to play. Yeah. And whatever you win, it's yours. And um, I used to, I, I used to, I used to do a lot of that. I used to climb trees. I have scars on my knee from climbing trees and so on. So I think growing up in the country equipped me with some resilient skills, some problem-solving skills, some independent and interdependent attributes that have helped me in later life. I went to Ashley Primary School, went to Glenmuir High School, left Glenmuir High School and went to Exed for sixth form. And then I got a scholarship from Exed to go to university. And then I went on to my master's, did my doctorate as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So along the way, because I want to find out what was the most um, in, in, in your earlier years, what would you say has been the, the most challenging thing for you? School. School? <laughs> school. Really? School. What, what about it was challenging? And um, I yeah. School in particular. Um, I didn't do very well in the first four years of high school, and my mother always threatened that you're not sending me back to school. Because By the way, I, again, your audio is, is uh, get, getting a little distorted. Do we have an, an earpiece? I think so. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I was looking for it yesterday and couldn't find it, and I need to be ordering another one. Are you not hearing me now? 
It's um, it, it, I'm hearing a lot of echo. I'm not sure if everybody else is hearing you like that. Is that how you're hearing her, Tanya and Tracy? On? Yeah, it's uh, there's an echo going yeah, on. So there's not clarity. Back. Hello. Are you seeing two of me on? Just one of you. I'm seeing two of me. Could it be that? I'm not sure unless you have because I'm just seeing you. I mean, you're down the bottom and you're here because we're all we're Are you all. Two of you. Yes. The same two of you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. So that's all right. Then. Are mm -hmm. you hearing me better? Not better. At one point you were good. I'm not sure what happened, but there is something. A call oh, came we're... in. I don't know. Well, well, you know, we're we're going to persist. We're going to persist because I can hear you, but it's just there is a little echo you think going I on. on my computer? Uh, maybe you should. So uh, we're going to get back to your point of uh, that challenge in school. In the meantime, let me go over to Tracian. Um, or boy, you know what? I mean, I'm not going to start. I'm not going to start with you. Both of you, I'm not going to start with your most challenging um, times. I'm going to ask you. Let me start with Tracian right here. Pick up with Tracian. What has been that most successful um, defining moment for you when you're thinking that you're thriving? What has been that moment for you? All right, that moment for me would be it's it's kind of difficult to find that one moment, but I think I think that moment for me it's kind of challenging to find that moment, but I'm gonna give you one. So that moment would be thriving. I'm gonna borrow Tanya's word and not being a survivor, but thriving out of a situation where I was on top and I went a little low at one point and afterwards I was able to be triumphant uh, assisting young persons in overcoming challenges. So I was at a point where I was super high then I got a little okay, bit Okay and low. what was that high? Let's not talk about the low right now. Let's talk about the high. What was that high for you? All right. So that high was coming out of high school going into college. I would have had my my first child i would have gotten pregnant at 13 and i would have gotten another chance from my parents to attend school so i would have been at charlemont high and then i went to dintel technical high at the age of 14 and back then in, before having my child i was a bit unsettled and i think that birth that i gave to my son at that time i think that opened my eyes and so when i went there i was i was on on a roll i was an b plus a student going right through i can remember every single award ceremony because we would have award ceremony for for two years two semester per year and every single award ceremony my mother would be at the front row sitting cheering me on after it is that I gave birth because everybody most persons would have thrown me out the window saying that I was I would have been um so you know the words MCA workless yes okay so I would have been the disgrace for my family but I proved them wrong because I went back to school I was an honor roll I wasn't an honor roll student before I was now an honor roll student going creating waves, motivating all students right. and hold all that, that. Thought. Hold that thought. So you were on a high after becoming pregnant at 13. Um, did you give birth at 13 or become pregnant at 13? I gave birth at 14. I, at 14, right. right. So you became pregnant at 13 and you're on a high because you went back to school and you're on honor roll. Stick right. that pin right there. Let's get back to Ensembleno with her um, <laughs> with her challenge with school because we're seeing a connection now, school and challenges and, and winning and all of that. Let's Let's go back there. Tracy, I so, honor you, girl, for doing so well at high school. <laughs> I, well at high school. I was great at primary school, but you know, it's the cream of the crop from primary school that got to high school. You know? <laughs> so at high school, I was among all the bright people that came from all of these other primary schools and prep schools and so on. So I didn't do well. And my mother always threatened that she's not going to send me back to school. Yeah. And I used to fret. Every summer I used to fret. And then close to school time, now I see her doing the uniforms and buying up the stuff and so on. So I got hopeful that I'm going back to school. But I did very well at, um, I did GCA. So it, sh it shows you how old I am, I'm 69 years old. Yeah. 
And I left from Glenmuir because Glenmuir didn't have a great six form at the time and went to Excelsior. Yeah. So at Excelsior, it was not bad at all because I had some, not that I didn't have good teachers at Glenmuir, but I was a, a lot more focused. I felt a lot more comfortable in my skin. Excelsior has that kind of equalizing, ego equalizing environment that regardless of where you come from, you kind of feel that you belong there. And then they it was it was an amazing journey for Excelsior. Um, what are the kind of challenge I, challenges I had? Uh, I never thought I was beautiful when I was growing up. Um, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s when you used to hear anything black, not too good. So those of us who had kinky hair and um, dark skin, we could not aspire to work in the bank because bank job was the thing to aspire to. So we had to aspire to go to university. And maybe that was an, an not maybe that was an amazing um, situation that that forced us to set our sights um, on higher higher order. Things. All right, so let's pause right there because what part of your challenge right now in some bit is the fact that you never thought you were beautiful, and um, and I know persons who are watching now listening no one in the replay can connect to that particularly if you grew up in another country yes. and you're black yes. anything too black no good yes so to see the person you are now and to hear that what you've been through we're going to at some point come back to this part of the conversation and asking you how you've managed to triumph that because some persons may look and, and say, oh, that's simple, you know, that's that's an easy thing to overcome. But it's it's yep. not. Once it's a mindset thing, it's not as easy to overcome. Yep. All right. So let's now bring Tanya into the conversation. Tanya, you you said earlier that you're a cancer thriver. You were about you were going about minding your own business. And lo and behold, you found out that hey, the big C has has come on. How did yeah. that go? What was that journey like? So take us from where you were, perhaps your high point doing what you were doing, and then wow, whoa, what is this? Yeah. So so and and you know it, it didn't happen at a high point, funny enough. Um, but you know, we all have disruptions in life. Yes. You know, we're all talking about coronavirus and the disruptions now. Um, well, we do have disruptions in our personal lives, and for yeah. me. And my family, it was actually a back-to-back -back blow because um, in 2018, my mom was diagnosed uh, with cancer and I had been away with her, being her caregiver, um, all through 2019 up to July. And so, you know, watching her and caring for her um, as she was going through that journey was, was something else, which I, which I guess we'll speak about. And then we came back home in July and by say October, a few weeks after my birthday, I was then diagnosed. It was like, it was not being on a high of me doing my thing because yes, I had transitioned into the personal development space. By the way, and somebody welcome to JMT. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you. having- I, We're family members. I've been in JMT for a while though. Okay, okay. And so, you know, as, as building out that practice and coaching, um, and then it all You're stopped. also an action coach, right? So you're John Maxwell coach yeah. and an action coach as well. Yeah, well, formally, yeah. I was formally, a business right. coach with, um, with, action with, coach. with action coach, right? So now I'm, you know, focused on, on leadership, ex executive leadership and personal development. Um, and, it's, and it's funny that Ensemble also spoke about... Um, you know, the self-image, because it's just today that I was putting the final touches um, to my newest program, which is self-image mastery, wow. you know. But it was during that time that my diagnosis came. And it was just strange because, you know, it, you felt like, wow, months after. But it was such, being with my mom was such preparation Wow. For me, it was you know, it, it was funny because we, we, what I talk about now, what I share with persons is that we actually created a recipe for thriving. Wow, you know, and and what that looks like, and it obviously it all begins up here, but it's something I'm excited to build out and and share. So yeah, but I want I want you to share with us 
how did you find out? What was it like at that point? Just take us through that journey. So you were in that preparation stage with your mom because I remember you were you were also helping with LeaderCast. Um, was yes. it women or son? And then you had to drop everything because mom needed you and rightfully so. So what was that like for you? Take us into that um, that space. You know, um, so. It was while while I was with her, while we were away, that, um, and I hope she's not listening because she doesn't know this, <laughs> um, that I, I figured out that something was up with me. You, you know, as women, we, we, we know our bodies. And, and this is the other thing I want to say, especially to the women we are, we are, who are listening. We know our bodies. We know when things have shifted on us. Uh, we know when something is just not right, but we also have this tendency to self-diagnose. And and so for me, I was I felt that that misalignment. I I, I felt what I self-diagnosed to be. Oh my gosh, it's early menopause. <laughs> you know that kind of a thing. But one night, I really felt that electricity through the breast, and I was like, I know. And I said nothing because I was still caring for mom. But when I came home, went to the doctors and, you know, we start, got it sorted out everything. By the time he was telling me, and, um, you know, that is what we're seeing. I was literally already in the space of affirming my health because I just knew, you know, was it easy in that moment? Absolutely not. You know, um, but for me, I, I'm so grateful I had all the support around me um, that every time, you know, it felt like this is it, I can't manage. Whether it was my partner, my sister, my mom, somebody just always lifting me up, my friends. Hey, Ava. So, you know, the space, I, I can honestly say, Penica, that even though it was back to back blows, and even though it felt it, it you know, we, we just know that these things are happening. Because of the journey prior, I didn't allow it to own me. I didn't allow that circumstance to own me. So I can't sit here and say, oh my gosh, I was depressed and da da da. It wasn't easy. But I didn't allow the circumstance to keep me down. Right. So here I am. What I'm hearing from this is all things work together for good. And that's one of yeah. my favorite scriptures in the Bible. All things work together for good for they that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Because I remember your journey with, with, with your mom or part of it. And as you rightfully say, it was preparation, you know, for you to deal with your own, um, your own situation and deal with it to the point now that you, you, you're of the mindset that you, call yourself a cancer thriver, right? And so I want to I want to pause here and to say that our mindset is absolutely critical in whatever it is that we are faced with. I remember my own um, depression that I went through when I sank into that, that depression that was so dark. I sank there, but although I couldn't, I felt no emotions, I was numb, I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't, I, I couldn't see the, the, the rainbow, you know? Um, couldn't see any light at the end of the tunnel or anything, but there was a thing. There, so it wasn't a matter of my feelings. It was a matter of my knowing. So although I was in that space that was so dark and that was another place that in some they helped me out of as well, right? Although that was a place that was so dark, I knew then that, you know, it's not a place that I'm living. I'm actually just passing through here. I want to get back to Tracy and story of being pregnant as th at, at 13. I am the product of a teenage mom. My mom had me when she was 16, right? And it was just last night I was having a conversation with her about some things and, you know, um, some things I'm just hearing for the first time and some challenges that she's been through and everything. But I cannot fathom somebody being pregnant, a young girl being pregnant at 13. So yes, thankfully you had parental support. Your mom was there as your biggest cheerleader and shout out to her. She didn't throw you out and, you know, and, 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 and toss you away. Shout out to her, commendations to her. But as a child, you are a child yourself. 
looking to bring a child into this world, um, this awesome responsibility that is now going to be placed on your shoulders. What was that feeling like for you? Um, what did you feel like? Did you even consider, like, you know what, let, 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 I'm not going to do this. I'm going to have an abortion. What was it like for you? It was rough. It was very, very rough. I did not contemplate abortion, none at all. Uh, for one, I grew up in a Christian home. My parents were very, very strong. And I was the only I was the only child up to about eleven years old. And I, I must say thanks to them for everything because they I wasn't one of the children who would have said, Look, I wasn't without things. I got every single thing that I wanted. So I can speak to that and I can say, look, persons who really had the opportunity to, to have very good have a very good life, they have those situations too. Not just the persons in marginalized situations, mm -hmm. but persons who had opportunities. And I was at a space because I was I was molested by a pastor earlier, earlier on, and I was molested by two of my family members. And I had that in my head. It was it was eating me out. And I had family members who kept telling my parents that, especially my mother, that I was having sex and nothing like that. I wasn't having sex, none at all. And she was taking me to the doctor months on top of months on top of months and nothing was happening. And I can tell you the following month after she stopped taking me to the doctor, that was the month I touched and I got pregnant. And at that point, they, I was bitter. I was bitter. I was, I was one of the, 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 I was so bitter. I hated everybody. I, my eyes were blessed on and I was in a very dark space. And I can remember one thing. Why were you bitter? Um, why were you bitter? I was bitter because the person who did it, I knew for a fact that he did it. And he said, yes, he told my mother, yes. But his mother told everybody, no. She told my mother, no. She told him in front of everybody, no, you did not do it. And I was so bitter knowing that he was there telling her that, yes, I did it, mom. And it was the first and only time we did it. And it happened. She was there saying no. And it hurt my feelings. And everybody in the, the space were saying I was a disgrace to my family. Being that I was one of the, I was a child in the community who was walking with my head high because I couldn't go anywhere apart from church and school. And so I was at that low where everybody, I was just walking with my head down. And so I can remember in the midst of the pregnancy, I remember my father saying something to me. I, I don't know if I can speak those words here, but that changed my life for the better. Mm -hmm. And I cried at that moment. And I said, you know what? I am not going to let my parents and my community, my family go to shame. I will turn this around and be the positive, make the positive from it. And so I did all right, so I want to take this moment as well, Tristan, to commend you, to affirm you, yes, to let you know that there is just there's a strong purpose on your life because at 13 years old to have that resolve, where you get it from, <laughs> you know, to be thinking, to be having that mindset that you know what I am going to use the situation, I'm going to turn it around. And I'm going to come back to the ladies, but I want to spend some more time with you, Tracy. And here's why. Because you've now gotten to adult, you know, got, you're now an adult. Having gone through that, you've been molested. I can relate. Um, you know, I'm the product of a tea mom. I've been told anything too black, no good. You know, come out to nothing good. All of these things. Um, and so many other things happening along the way. And yet you, you, so you're no, you, you were no married. So take us to that because I know a little bit of her story. I can jump to some places just to, you know, connect the dots because I want to get to some point before we end. Now, take us to adulthood. You know, you're there carrying on, you're married and all of these things. And then what started happening? What, what's, what's been going on? All right. So after I left high school, went into college, I was doing so well. I met this gentleman in college. And he was the sweetest soul, the sweetest soul. He swept me off my feet every single thing. When you talk about the, the goodness of a man, everything, 
let me tell you, that was the perfect man in my eyes. And I can remember I introduced him to my parents because I've never taken anybody home to my parents and I introduced him to my parents and you know they did the questioning the, the question and answer segment and all of that and my father said why if you decide say I will take care of my picnic you know you know we say half yes and half no but if you know decide say I will take care I'll leave it right here and he decided that he would have taken care of me and we left started a merry life Bops, I got pregnant with my daughter, and all hell break loose right there. So I was on my, I was in my second year at college because I'm kind of jumping fast. I was in my second year at college right now, and when I got pregnant, and all hell break broke loose. I got my first hit when I was about seven to eight months pregnant. I can recall I was having... When you say first hit, because that, that don't sound like what it is. So explain, so it's in a way that we understand exactly what you're saying. A man lick me down from the bed, punch me. Yeah, because when you said first me. hit, I'm sure the ladies here <laughs> didn't even understand that's exactly what you meant. So I want to make sure everybody understands what you're talking about. Go right ahead. All right. So I can remember I was speaking to one of my... Because I was all about empowerment at that time. And I was speaking to one of my girlfriends and she was in a, in a similar situation because she was being abused by her partner. And I remember I was on the phone and I was telling her, no, you can't let that man treat you like that. You cannot stay in that relationship. I'm going to get help for you. And the gentleman was there and he was listening. And when I realized the man licked me down from the bed and say, oh, you're dear in here. I tell people, say, get out of this relationship like some day you're abused. So I say, it's not about you. I am counseling my friend. So how is it about you and him start? I get some licking on my face with the big tummy in front of me. And his mother was there as well. And I went outside and I told her. And she was like playing it small. I was like, him just mash me up in the house. So who, why is it that you're playing it small? And I can recall I walked out of the house. And I, wa I walked about a mile, a mile, mile, mile and a half about and i just wanted to get out of the space out of the, that particular situation for a, a while and i went and i was crying walking on the road crying and it was a residential community so for me to be walking in that community crying persons would be driving past seeing me you know eyes would be turning and i called my aunt she was living in angels because i couldn't tell my mother and i couldn't tell my father because had I said something to my father, I knew right there and then that my father would have been in jail right now, prison right now, and I couldn't allow that to happen, and I hid it from them. I didn't say anything, and I called my aunt in Angels, and we, we spoke. I didn't tell her anything either, because I knew if I said something to her, she would have said it to my mother, and then everything would have happened, so I hid it. And I hid it for one because I was contemplating on the fact that I wanted my child to grow up with her father, being that I was in a situation, I was raised in a situation where my parents were married and Christian home, everything. So I wanted that for my child as well. And I don't play it. And I went back to the house and he apologized. And, you know, sweetness start again. And I was back in, in that space. And I can recall it never stopped. It never stopped. It was beaten, pant up, beaten, pant up, beaten. After I had my daughter, it was the same situation. Fast forward, I lived in there, that situation for 10 years. For 10 years. And I hid it for 10 years. I can recall a lot of times he was, because I would have gone to the country to stay with my parents for some weekends to look for them, you understand, to just to, you know, country people we tend to leave out of the country for a while, you know, we say, well, go back to the country, go um, chill out with parents for the weekend. And so almost every weekend I would have gone to the country to stay with my parents. And I remember one particular weekend when I was, Sunday when I was going home, my father said, oh, you look like you don't want to go home. So, and I started crying. And he knew that something was wrong and he was questioning me. And I was done playing it just the same. And I ended up going home. And... Uh, I started a youth group in my community, a police youth club. And I can recall my father, I was saying to my father, I want a, 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 a guest speaker for my youth, for, to speak to my youth for that particular night. Because we had meetings on Saturdays. And I said, Daddy, I can't find anybody to 
to, to, to in the category that I really want to inspire and motivate a youth because I think they would be tired of seeing me and tired of hearing me. So I wanted a fresh face there. And I was saying to him, I, I can't find anybody. And he said to me, he said, why you not ask Jeff? And I said, who is Jeff? And he said to me, you don't know Mass Benson, man? And I said, me don't know who him, so. And he said, may I call him for you? And he called him and he told him, told him to give me his number and i called him and i spoke to him and he didn't hesitate and he came to the meeting the the saturday evening and the meeting went well so i slept over because i would have um went back home the following day that would have been the sunday at that time i was just using whatsapp wasn't familiar with whatsapp and all of that so you know country the typical country place you won't find get good signal digital line you wouldn't find good signal at that particular spot so i would have to go up in the on the hills and hold my phone like this to get a one bar and so i couldn't get whatsapp there and when i went home they went back home the sunday evening i realized that i was getting a lot of missed calls on whatsapp so i saw a missed call from the the gentleman he was a guest speaker and i returned the call and i thanked him for gracing us with his presence at the meeting and all of those good things and we chit chat for a couple minutes and we said bye lo and behold the gentleman heard me boot boot back, back again one whole heap of lick again because he was saying you're good their country you come and talk to man on the phone and all of that so them and I, I would I, I bear it I bear it because again I say look here I need my child to all right that so you've been bearing it for 10 and at this point 10 years 10 years what was that turning point for you what was it that said okay enough is enough all right it happened when I almost lost my life so the same situation uh it happened that the same gentleman who I was speaking to I remember the following week I was sitting inside and I, ro I had roast breadfruit and ackee and saltfish for dinner the evening. Jamaican and, girl, yeah? <laughs> and the gentleman, he, lo and behold, he texts me all of a sudden and he was saying, how are you? And all of that. So I was saying, I'm okay, you know, I'm having dinner. He said, what's for dinner? And I said, ackee and saltfish with roast breadfruit. He used the emoji, the tongue and the mouth to say the nice food mm -hmm. or whatever. Anyways, we talk and he said, all right, I was just checking on you to see how you're doing. And the conversation um, ended. The Saturday morning, I, I, I got up. The, Saturday, the Friday night, I went to bed and I had a dream. I, in the dream, I was getting married. I was in the white gown with another friend in Tidex by the name of Anna. And she was my bridesmaid. And in the dream, we were in a lot of murky water. And I was like, where all this murky water come from all of a sudden so i got up the morning because i was going to do my laundry and i got up the morning and i i immediately had a, a headache and i was like what's this headache the first when i looked at my phone the first message that i saw was from the same gentleman and he was saying how are you i'm just checking in on you and i said you know being that i come from country you know i get a weird dream and i don't know what's the meaning and i said it to him and he said to me, pray about it. That's not a good dream. Pray. And I said, you know, I pray already, but I'm going to pray again. And I put on the phone and I went into the, the wash, washroom. As I put on my phone, the gentleman came around, took it up. He took it to my daughter. She unlocked it and he started going through the conversation. He saw the, the emoji that the gentleman sent to me with the tongue and the moat and he started went for my shit, all of that i had to be running around the house mm -hmm. i ended up slamming his hand in the door and the machete dropped and i we had a barrel outside with water and i took the machete and i dropped it in the barrel with the water and i was running mm -hmm. my daughter started crying because my neighbor they were her child and my child they went to the same prep school and her daughter heard my my daughter crying and she was like what Timoya no normally cry. Something is happening. And her daughter was like, Timoya crying, mommy, run, come, run, come. At that time, Timoya was outside crying. And so they called the police. And at that time, he caught me because I was coming through the, the veranda. And he 
uh, came around the other side and he, he caught me and he slammed my hand in the door. And to this day, I have a mark on it just the same. And he pushed me on the bed. He had, had my hand in my his hand in my throat and he was beating me punching me punching me punching me and i was i literally saw angels in front of me and this is no joke i literally saw angels in front of me and i said lord you're going to let me die and i have my children living for and the tears were flowing and i remembered that he had earlier at that time and i kicked him in his tummy and that was how he got off of me and I remember I went to the side of the bed and I couldn't get up because I hurt my back. I was feeling a lot of pain and I couldn't get up. But I managed I crawl and crawl and crawl and I managed to um, get out of the house. And uh, the police came and we went to the station and all of that. So that was when I was able to get out because I said, look, this is it. Not again. And that happened June 2017. And I never looked back. And remember... I didn't have anywhere to go apart from my parents' house. And I decided that, look, I'm not going to go back there because people are, they are going to laugh at me. All right. Let's pause right there. That story, um, I know we spent some time on it, but it was worth you telling. And it's not just for, you know, centralization, the sensitizing of it. What Sensationalism, that's the word I'm looking for, of that story. But it's a lesson to all women, because a lot of women go through what you go through, right? But they don't live to tell the story like you do. Sure. So we give thanks to God that you live, you're alive to share the story and you've created, you know, your, your support group and you're creating a lot of things out of that, which we commend you for. And again, commend you for your strength to share the story publicly and to, you know, to encourage and to inspire. It's not just sharing it in a vacuum just because, you know, you can you can share it. So with that, we have two coaches right here, <laughs> right? Um, they've listened to your story. They too have had their challenges. Let me start with um, Ensemble. What would you want to say now to, to Tracy? And we're even taking it off your story and just, what would you want to say to her now? I would have some questions that I'd like to ask Tracy. Because Tanya, you know, that's a process. Because Tracy has all the answers within her. And so as coaches, our job is to really help her to find those answers by asking some questions. So if Tanya and I could tag team, I would love that because we're in the same space. So the question I want to ask you, which a lot of women are, who are listening would want to hear, what is it that made you stay? The, from I, the first time and the second time, you recognize that that was a character trait. And um, as I say, you can't change people. Yeah. What is it that made you stay? I stayed for a couple of reasons. One, I said I wanted my children to grow in the same house with both parents. I wanted them to grow with a mother and a father, right? I didn't want a broken family because I would have seen it uh, in my community what a broken family um, was like, and I did not want that. And I did not want it to be, I'm the first child for, for my parents, and then I would say, look, I went through that particular situation and now to come back and have a broken family, I, I was terrified and I stayed for, I think that's the biggest reason why I stayed with him. And then I was trying to change him because each time he did it, I was like, he would apologize, sweep me up and he would change for a week or two and then it went right back. I was trying to change someone who couldn't change he didn't want to be changed. So I was there trying to change that person. So those are two of the biggest reasons why it is that I stayed. One, for the for, for, for both for the children to be growing with both parents. Two, for the fact that I was trying to change a person who didn't want to be changed. Did you ever see your father beat your mother? No, never. So never. So despite the fact that you wanted a, a home where both parents are, 
the behaviors of your father compared to your husband mm -hmm. were two completely different behaviors. Did it, did it ever occur to you that this is what your daughter is seeing and uh, it might just be replicated in her life? Yes, it occurred to me in 2017, the same day that I got out, it occurred to me that day because I was saying to myself, I was bearing this for 10 years. My daughter was seeing this for so long. What if she ended up in that particular relationship? Mm -hmm. What would I be doing? What would I think? I would have blamed myself to say, look, I caused this because she was there and I could have gotten out of the situation. I could have taken a different stance rather than trying to change a person and wanting both um, both parents to be in the same house. I thought of that. And that was the turning point when I said, look, this is it. Never again. Because one of the things that, um, and I really want persons to, to know here is that you cannot change a person who doesn't want to be changed that person would want to be in that particular space mentally before you can, can try and get help for him. Mm -hmm. Right? So if the person... Go ahead, the person, find, finish your thought. So if the person doesn't want, doesn't show any form of changes, or doesn't show any form of behavioral pattern stating that he wants to be changed, it's, it's time for you to get out. Just get out of the situation. Don't stay. Don't hesitate. None at all. Don't hesitate. Absolutely. And, and that was the question I was going to ask you. What of the lessons you have learned from this experience that you would share with, because there are lots of women, lots of women who are listening all over the world who are in similar situations, have been in similar situations. What is that one thing, one, one word that you would, you, you would share with them I can't say one word, but I can say three words. Get out alive. Or put it to four. Get out alive now. Don't hesitate. Don't look back. Don't double think about it. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. But what I can tell you is that you will overcome. You will be triumphant. But you need to get out alive now. Yes, and My last word before I turn over to Tanya is that it is fear to a great extent that prevent women from leaving the situation. Fear of the unknown. Where am I going to live? How am I going to manage? And so on. But you and I know that God is our source. God is the provider. God is the one who has been taking care of all our needs from we were babies until now. And that same God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right. And he is our source. And so once we set our intentions and we step out in faith, then that God will step in and take care of us. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I with you. Yes, Daniel, we want to hear from you. Um right. as so, to Tracy on. Well, if I'm if I may if I may just take the conversation just a little bit off Tracy on because there's so many nuggets and lessons yes. even from her story. And I think Ensemble really just brought it home with the mm -hmm. lessons. So, you know, one of the things that really came home to me is is when she said, you know, and that was a question I was wondering. What example are you setting? Do you think you were setting for your daughter? Yeah. And so one of the things I've, I've truly come to realize is that, um, especially for women, you know, being recognizing or really owning that we are, our kids are modeling us is, is almost has become almost a secondary thought as we are going through our lives. Mm -hmm. Now it may not be, um, you know, a situation as 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 terrible as Tracians, for example, but it could simply be that you are living such an unfulfilled life, a life that where every day you get up and you are in you are in pain, mental, emotional. You are feeling contracted in, instead of expansive, and mm -hmm. so you get up and you are you know you become miserable and untenable, and you drag yourself to work. And then you come home and you express, you know, those expressions and those emotions 
and we scream and shout at our kids. And then, you know, when we say, you know, when we try to say, okay, what do you want? Can we then move on to look at what do you want um, out of life? You know, how do you want to move? What example, you know, th then the fear, as you're saying, in some way sets in. And we figure that, no, we can't move because I can't afford to give up the paycheck. I can't afford to move to somewhere else. But then at the end of it, we also want the best for our kids. And so my question always comes back, well, is this the example that you want to set for your child? It's okay not for you to live a full life. It's okay for you to be miserable. It's, it's okay for you to feel constricted. And so just coming out of that, you know, and, and, and again, this has brought me full circle to why I actually decided to do a program on self-image mastery because yeah is driven from how we see ourselves. That's how we show up on, on the inside. You know, and, and there is a research by a doctor um, who is a part of the program, a plastic surgeon, and he says, you know, it, it was about as he was doing plastic surgery on persons to co correct deformities or whatever it was, there were so many of them that even though they had been transformed into, into swans, they yeah. still looked in the mirror and, and did not yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 i saw that today i was watching our next level summit too and i saw that same example yeah yeah awesome yeah. <laughs> and, and so you know that's a big part of the conversation Absolutely. um you know so there's the fear so there is why am i sitting in this situation for 10 years and if i looked if i truly look in the mirror you know how am i seeing myself yes I may be saying the right words and doing some of the actions, but deep down in the subconscious, mm. what am I truly telling myself? Absolutely. I can't live without this person. I can't earn without this person. My family won't be good with me alone. You know, whatever it is that, that that's happening there. Um, yeah. But Tracy, I also have to say just absolutely kudos um, to you. You are, you are amazing. You're amazing. Yeah. Yes, and, and I, have typed, I have typed in our private chat, your mind is a garden. Your thoughts are the seeds. You can grow flowers or you can grow weeds. And I think it's important that we tend the garden of our mind and root out all of this weed thoughts out of our minds, especially in terms of how we see ourselves. Because Henneke, remember earlier on I said, one of my challenges growing up, I never, I never thought I was beautiful because all my other sisters were gorgeous and I was the ugly duckling. And people used to look at me and they used to say, your eyes are so beautiful. And I go home and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm looking at what is it that they are seeing. You see that Excelsior, that Excelsior school, that's where I found myself. You see, as black people, when we start loving ourselves, mm -hmm. when we start seeing ourselves as God made us, and that's what Excelsior provided for me. I was able to look inside of myself and see myself as a black, beautiful person. And then it's like a flower inside just start mm -hmm. opening up and opening up and opening up. And that's one of the reasons that, that, that brought me into Rastafari because Rastafari showed me myself as a beautiful queen and I was able to accept myself in that state. Of course, there are lots of other challenges and so on in it, but that part of my life was a self-defining period where I grew to love myself as God. Wow, you know, that's that's a conversation that we could even start another time, you know, the, the whole Rastafarian movement, because, I mean, granted, there are some aspects of it that we don't cling to, right? But when we look at the liberty, when we look at the health um, mm -hmm. aspects, yes. 
a long time them know them know you know exactly a long time them know them know when you look at the health not just not just physically but you let the health of the mind and what you think yes. about yourself right yes. so that that movement for me i don't see it as a religion because it's not my religion but i see it as a movement and i there, there are so many tenets of it that i hold to and so as we are about to wrap because time one hour is gone already uh we're gonna take the next 15 minutes and just wrap and here's what I want us to do as a theme here um, for International Women's Day is choose the challenge, right? We've seen some situation we, based on the conversation. We've seen that you are women, powerful women who are challenging the status quo, challenging the fact that guess what? I'm not a man's beating stick. My life is important. My life is valuable. Challenge the fact that I am not going to be defined by cancer or or anything that comes my way. Challenge the fact that not because they, I, I came in a black skin that I am not beautiful, not because, you know, um, I, I, I perhaps don't have the, the color of connection. And we know we live in a very classy um, a society that deals with, with colorism a lot, right? No, I want us to close. First of all, let me wrap, um, start off again by saying thank you so much for sharing your value, for sharing your, your wealth of information, for sharing yourselves with us. You are, you're awesome. And these are not just platitude, platitudes, but I saw power in all of you. And all of you, you're at different levels in your life, different stages and phases and all of these things. But there is one common thread. And I said I would have identified it along the way. And that common thread is really resilience. Yes, yes. Is resilience. Yes. And I salute you, Black women, powerful, strong women. I salute you. And with that, just close off. And I'm not going to ask anybody um, in any particular order, but just close off by telling us, how are you choosing to challenge? And with that, as you tell us how you're choosing to challenge, share your contact details and your projects that you're working on so that uh, our audience members in terms of those watching now or further down the road can connect with you to be a part of your tribe, be a part of what you're building, your community, your awesomeness. So, uh, Go ahead, go ahead. I'm not calling on any, any particular order. <laughs> All right, so for me, I'm choosing to challenge myself to empower persons, empower every person that I get in contact with, to let them know that you are beautiful, whether it's a female or a male, you're strong, you're handsome, a woman, you're beautiful. I want to empower I want to be the inspiration for you. I want to help you to speak life to yourself i want to help you to be as in some said your mind is a garden your thoughts are the seeds you can grow flowers or you can grow weeds i want to help you to get out of the, get the weeds out of that garden so you can be beautiful you can blossom and you can bloom so with that said you can i have a project um get out of, get out a live world you can follow me on instagram facebook twitter it's at get out alive world uh it, it's it's a campaign where we're trying to help victims of domestic violence and child abuse what we want to do is we want to break the cycle instead of waiting until it gets to a particular stage where we try to correct it we want to break it from a early stage from the 13 years or 14 year old we want to target them because they are the ones who are getting involved in those relationships that turns out to be bitter so at the end of it so if we can correct it at that particular stage we're on our way to a bigger better nation yes. a place to live raise families and do business awesome awesome thank you tracy you're welcome tanya you know, um, I'm a approaching just about the one year anniversary of when I was laying in the hospital, you oh. know, after surgery, staring up at the ceiling fan, just going around and around. And as I laid there, you know, there's this poem by Dr. Miles Monroe that, that popped into my head that I'd heard um, probably in 1992 about where the richest place on earth is. And it's not, the, yeah. you know, the you know, I, I don't know it in full and I need to learn it. It's, it's not mm -hmm. the, the, where the oils are found or the diamond mines in 
in in you know in Africa, but it's Great. it's within us. It's in it's in the cemetery because there's so many gifts and talent and dreams and inspiration that has died within us. And I tell you, as I was laying there in that room, it's almost like I was seeing on every blade. I was seeing one of the dreams that I had kind of you know, put aside, walk into the beat of what society expected, what persons expected of me, the things I wanted, I wanted to do. But, and here's the thing, what is big for me, I, 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 I couldn't express my voice, but I was showing up in what someone now tells me was your zone of excellence. Mm-hmm. You know, you've been, you know, vice president in the financial sector and really good and whatever. But it's just now that I'm showing up in 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 in, in my zone of genius. Yes. And so what I want to say to women is it's you know, I choose to challenge myself and you to find your voice. Yes. You know, as I was laying there and I came out, I said, you know, one of the things I've always wanted to do is write a book. One of the things I've always wanted to do is be on the stage, the international stage. Well, for everybody listening, join me on Friday at Women Crushing Mediocrity Summit, <laughs> which yes, promises yeah. to be an amazing international, you know, really. I'm already registered. Yay. Thank you. And the <laughs> other thing is coming out of that, um, we will have a follow up book anthology of which. I'm a contributing author. So yes, not like you, yes, Annika, not my own book, but it's a start. Why am I saying this? We have to decide for what we want. Yes. You know, whatever is, is deep within us, it's yes. time for us to find our voice. Yes. As, as, as Dr. Cheryl Wood says, you know, what you're sitting on, someone is waiting on. Yes. And that's my role now in helping persons to find that voice and express that voice. In other words, to live expansively. Yes. So follow live me. Full die um, empty. Yeah, exactly. Full <laughs> die empty. empty. You know, I'm, I'm also now being trained by, by the great um, Les. Les Brown. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I get all this in, in, in coming at me also. Um, so, you know, and, and this is why I'm also starting with self. So my project, my, my little baby, I'm owning it now. And it's today that I owned it. So thank you, Henneka. You're welcome. <laughs> For me actually putting it out there now. So now there's no turning back, full expression. <laughs> Self-image mastery. You know, it's about you cannot outperform your self-image. You can't outperform how you see yourself. And so that for me now is how do I help you to raise that self-image, raise how you see yourself, come from a place of possibility and brave thinking. It is possible. Absolutely. And so, you know, my website, let me let me admit, it's it's under construction, but there's enough stuff there. Tanya so, D. So it's all of us under construction. That's all right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, TanyaDPowell.com and also on Facebook, Tanya D. Powell and Tanya D. Powell um, on Instagram. I look forward to, and, and what I'm offering for everybody who is who is listening, there's a lead magnet, an amazing lead magnet on my website. Well, I hope it's gone up if we're doing that work today. But if it's not up, I'm offering a complimentary breakthrough strategy session for an hour. If you just want to hop onto that call, just go on my website, book that call, and we get on and see how I can support you. Just because you're here, because it's absolutely Absolutely amazing. amazing. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. And some of my friend. (laughs) And so it's all of you. Okay, let's you all get jealous now. (laughs) Such such powerful women, you know. Um, I'm so glad to be a part of this community right at this moment. As many of you know, I have been a consultant for a few decades, working with organizations, helping them to implement systems, quality management systems, strategic management processes, and so on, to transform organizations. And over the years, I was seeking more, 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 more. You know, you get to that pace in life where you kind of plateau, you ask them for more, you're not sure what the more is, you know? But you want more. The Bible says, seek and you shall find, knock yes. and it shall be open, ask and it shall, it shall be, be given. And as Amen. I asked for more, 
let me tell you, what you are seeking is seeking, is seeking you. Sister and I have that conversation all the time. What you're seeking is seeking you. So be intentional about what you want. That's what Tanya said. See clearly in your mind's eye what you want. Now, there are some people who can't see it. So as a coach, what I help people to do is to blueprint that vision for themselves. So a lot of times when they come to me, they, they don't know, they can't see it, they can't even think it, they can't even imagine it. And during my 12-week program of helping them to convert a dream that they never even had before into a dream that starts giving them results in a short time, Thoreau says, if you advance confidently in the direction of your dreams, endeavoring to live the life you are imagining, you will pass invisible boundaries and meet with unexpected success in common hours. Do you know how many of the youngsters in my coaching program who came not knowing what they want and midway through made some major breakthroughs in their lives, achieving some of the great things that they never even knew they wanted? to achieve. God is amazing. And so that is my life's goal. And that's one of the reasons why I joined the JMT family so many years ago, Tanya, in order to help leaders in organization, because there are lots of my sisters and brothers in corporate right now who are not finding the fulfillment. They have the positions, they have the salaries, they have the influence and all of that, but deep within they are dissatisfied. There is a longing and a discontent in them. My role is to help us to find that purpose that God placed us here with so that we can live on purpose and feel like we are swimming in the river in the direction in which the river is flowing. So if you are interested, I'll also give you a, a, a 45 minute to a one hour coaching session. Yes. And if you send me an email, the first 10 people who send me an email at insombijaj at gmail.com, N-S-O-M-B-I-J-A-J-A -A -A at gmail.com. The first 10 emails that I see in my inbox when I click on, I will send you a little questionnaire, just six questions for you to answer, and then I'll take you through a one hour session. And if you feel that that will work for you, then we can make this a more formal thing. I am a John Maxwell team member. We are people of value, adding value to others. And I'm a party of the Change Your World mission of John Maxwell, changing your world one person at a time. Tanya, I am so glad to be part of this amazing family. And I know I'm going to see you tomorrow. And the day after, I'm going to be facilitating um, two speakers table tomorrow and the day after, because I'm in mentorship and then I'm stepping up into crowd right. this week. Awesome. Okay, awesome. So if you look on my face, there is a permanent smile yeah. that is just plastered there. <laughs> and it is a smile, a permanent smile of gratitude. Gratitude to all of you, ladies. You have given your time. You have shared. And it was just a conversation. It wasn't planned. It wasn't structured. I just wanted to do this because I know somebody. And if it inspires one person, our time would have not been in vain. Right? And I'm really grateful to you, Tracy and Harridge, Tanya Powell, and Sambi Jaja, Dr. Nsambi Jaja, loving the loads, grateful for the stories that you've shared. We could talk about this some more, perhaps another time we do something different, but I'm glad that we could spend some time together on this International Women's Day in a, in a time when women are recognizing more and more our worth, and we are deciding that we're not taking any crap. We're going to be using the crap for fertilizers. Yeah. yeah. We're using the crap as fertilizer. Yeah. We're not taking it in at all. We're not ingesting no. it. We're using it to fertilize. So we're growing through our pain, whatever it is, right? There are other stories that we could have shared. I know Ensemble went through, um, because she shared at our health summit that I had earlier this year, Slow Down and Live, went through some health challenge as a result of just going, going, going because of the person she is. Oh, I too yes. went through, right? <laughs> or, yeah, I too went through something... Um, 
I don't even like there's a whole different story, right? Since April of last year. But here we are. You've all been you've been through your different things, and there is nothing we will not discount anybody's story because your story is powerful and it is unique to you, right? Somebody else could have gone through the very same thing, but your perception of it is different. The way you you would have dealt with it is different, right? So each story is unique. And for that reason, I commend you. I salute you. I applaud you. I love you. I love you as my sisters. And I'm grateful that you're part of my community. I'm grateful that you're a part of my circle. You inspire me in one way or another. You are the wind beneath my wings. And I thank you. So love you more, Hanika. <laughs> you are amazing. Thank you. I appreciate you. Until we touch base again, as I like to say, what good. Take care. Bye-bye. Yes, take care. Thank you for tuning in to the replay. Be in touch with these powerful women. They have shared some giveaways. They've shared where you can connect with them next time. You can share this video with others because I know not many people get a chance, uh, got a chance to watch, but you can always share it and persons can catch it on the replay. Um, a lot of powerful nuggets that were delivered. So thank you. Enough love. What good. Bye-bye.